All right, welcome everyone to this week's Ronin Seminar. We've got Christina Kilgrove is going to talk to us about reading past lives and bones and Romans and all sorts of stuff like that. Go for it. <laughs> thanks, John. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks for inviting me to do one of these things. Um, and thanks to all of you who are zooming in today um, to, to, to listen to me. Um, talk about bones. Yeah, so I'm a bioarchaeologist um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more um, in just a minute about like what that all means. Um, and um, I do want to note uh, before starting this presentation that as you can see on your screen, um, I there are photographs of, of human bones um, in this presentation. Um, these were all taken with permission of the Italian Archaeological Superintendency. They're shown with, um, uh, they meet all Italian ethical guidelines um, and fun things like that. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be telling you a little bit about uh, uh, my work, um, the sort of stuff that, that, that I do. Um, and I am, uh, in addition to being affiliated with the Ronin Institute um, for many years now, um, I uh, am affiliated with UNC Chapel Hill, um, which is where I got my PhD. Um, and they are nice enough to help um, support my work by giving me an email address and access to the library, <laughs> which is great. They don't pay me, but um, all of that is useful. Um, and then at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my um, outreach and the other sorts of, of writing that I do. Um, but well, once I can figure out how to change slides here, let's see. There we go. Okay, that's the that's the first slide. There we go. I'm very new to Zoom meetings, so <laughs> I apologize for being confused about how this works. Um, so I do want to talk just a little bit about the the, the Roman Empire, um, uh, so that when I start talking about human remains, you can better understand um, where I'm going with this. And so I came at bioarchaeology. Um, as someone with a lifelong interest in the Roman world. Um, I've always been interested in burials. I was sort of a creepy kid um, who really liked skeletons. Um, and so it's really cliche to say this, but, but I've wanted to be an archeologist since I was a kid. Um, and what really piqued my interest though, uh, was not necessarily the language or the architecture or the artifacts, like those things are super cool too, but it was really the lack of information. Um, about skeletons, skeletons that were in graves that I saw in textbooks um, on the ancient Roman world and the ancient Greek world. Um, and so those same textbooks talk a lot about pottery and jewelry and other grave goods, but um, these are generally people or burials and lives that were elite. Um, these are people who could be contextualized with historical records. They were quite literally the 1% of Rome. Um, and so we, what we know about is, is the, the wealthy, we know about um, educated male citizens, and they're this very small, minuscule proportion um, of the Roman world, but they controlled the government, um, the economy, the military, religion. Um, and so the, this, this vast amount of information drew me in initially to, to Roman archaeology, but I really stayed in it because of what we don't know um, about the Romans. We don't know about the 99%. We don't know about lower class men. We don't know about women, children, slaves, foreigners, basically the majority of the people um, who, who did the work to, to keep the empire running. Um, so the Roman Empire, of course, lasted uh, for about four centuries, um, from the first to fourth centuries AD. Um, at its height, which you see here, um, this is in the early second century AD, it was about 1.7 million square miles. Okay, so this is from England to Egypt, um, from Mauritania to Armenia, and uh, it peaked at about 100 million people um, who were living there. And at any given time, there were about 1 million people uh, living in the city of Rome um, and its suburbs. So my research is largely focused on the core itself, um, on Rome, um, but I'll also be talking a little bit about my work at Aplantis, which is outside of Pompeii in uh, southern Italy. So, um, well, the, the historical, the archaeological records are really amazing. Um, from Rome, there are um, these gaps, right? We don't know that much about people um, who weren't allowed to write histories. Um, the people who likely couldn't read or write, even if they wanted to uh, uh, document their, their experiences. So it's really incredibly problematic to reconstruct the Roman Empire, to reconstruct the entirety of the experiences of everybody in the empire based solely on these reports from um, elite educated men, um, based solely on government construction projects, um, 
like aqueducts and temples um, based on art commissioned by the elite by and large. Um, and so this is one of the reasons I started studying Latin in high school, like 25, almost 30 years ago. Um, and what I came to realize after studying for years, studying classical languages, art and archeology, span it's that we need this new line of evidence um, that, that nobody had studied in the past two millennia to shed new light on the ancient Romans so that we're not just endlessly rehashing, you know, um, Cicero or Caesar over and over and over again. Um, unfortunately, for many years, human skeletons were seen as essentially worthless, um, especially compared to the written record, um, the material record. Um, but by the early 21st century, so around the time I was graduating from, uh, uh, from undergrad, there was a shift in which burials were no longer viewed as this as strictly material culture, as uh, strictly something to be put into a typology. Um, but people uh, began to investigate them in this biocultural manner um, with reference to individual skeletons, individual life courses, these individual identities um, that we could reconstruct from, from skeletons. So human skeletons were not a part of Roman archaeology until very recently. And part of the reason is because in North America anyway, um, in North American academia, the study of ancient skeletons is done within an anthropology department, um, not in a classics department, which is where Roman archeology span is. Um, so the study of human remains is uh, from archeological sites is called bioarchaeology, and um, it falls under one of the four subfields of anthropology, um, which in the US was created by Franz Boas, um, and those are cultural, linguistic, archaeology, and biological anthropology. Each of those has their own subfields, um, but bioarchaeology is basically a combination of biological anthropology and archaeology, um, but it's very interdisciplinary. Um, we use biology, anatomy, chemistry, ecology, geology, medicine, um, basically anything we can get our hands on to, to try to understand these, these ancient lives. And then of course, fundamental to bioarchaeology is osteology, which is the study of human skeletal remains. Um, and it turns out that you can learn quite a lot from those skeletons that I saw in textbooks um, when I was a kid. Um, chief among those, um, we can learn about demography. Uh, we can also learn about pathology. And um, so these topics, uh, demography, pathology, variation, are uh, really foundational questions in bioarchaeology. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some of these um, before we get to, to chemical analysis, which is the much more uh, uh, sciencey part um, of my talk. Um, and so given the fact that roughly a million people lived in Rome um, at any given time, you would think that there would be millions of skeletons, but of course, since they haven't really been preserved since the 1990s, um, since or until the 1990s, um, we don't have that many skeletons. There are maybe 20,000 or so, 30,000 skeletons maybe um, from Rome um, in the imperial period with probably more in, in Britain, um, just because of a longer uh, archeological tradition of, of saving those remains. Um, so this slide shows you um, some of the suburban cemeteries that were excavated um, leading up to the Grand Jubilee um, in 2000, the um, uh, Catholic celebration, uh, when a lot of infrastructure started going in, like roads and other sorts of improvement projects, and they started to find lots and lots of cemeteries. So all those little green dots um, are cemeteries. And these are not rich cemeteries. Um, these are cemeteries uh, for uh, the lower classes. You see some of the types of tombs here, um, the Cappuccina tomb, which is uh, where you use um, roof tiles, flat and curved roof tiles, um, you sort of recycle them, I guess, from your house, um, and you put them over the body. Um, amphorae burials, uh, these are largish transport amphorae um, that are broken uh, and you can bury kids in those. Um, so, you know, there's a coin here and there or some nails, but for the most part, there are no grave goods. Um, and uh, it's, there's been little research on these because not very many people are interested in them. They don't have all of the cool pottery um, and it's hard to, for the Italians to fundraise um, to preserve these sorts of cemeteries when like they're just bones. 
Um, so I'm going to tell you about some of the uh, cemeteries that I have worked on um, that, that have had uh, preserved remains. Um, oh, but it's, it, it's important to note that all of these cemeteries are found outside the city walls of Rome. Um, and that's the, the orange part of Rome right there, because um, the Romans didn't bury their dead inside the city walls. Um, there was a religious prescription against it, um, but also they knew that it was unhygienic <laughs> to bury the dead uh, within their walls. Um, so one of the, this is one of the uh, cemeteries that I've studied. Um, this was for my uh, dissertation a few years ago, um, found in the 1990s, excavated primarily in the early 2000s, um, called Casal Bertone, uh, named after the modern neighborhood um, in the suburbs of Rome. And so it's got um, a mausoleum, uh, which you can see on the left. Um, it's sort of a built structure um, with these niches for uh, people to be buried in. Um, and then on the right is a more simple necropolis uh, where people are buried in that cappuccino style um, or the amphora style. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is 2000 to about 2007 um, excavation uh, happened there. Um, another site that I've looked at um, is called Castellaccio Europarco, um, and this is located south of Rome, um, uh, also in the suburbs, and was a little bit more rural. Um, this was a, a sort of agricultural area um, outside of Rome. They found uh, warehouses, sort of storage buildings, um, and all of these, uh, these burials, um, the red ones that you see, are uh, located along a road because um, it was very common to bury people along the roads leading into Rome because you want people who are visiting um, to walk past your ancestors you know, as they're heading into Rome. Um, this is very traditional. Um, so the ones that, that I'm going to be referring to are, are phase three, those imperial period burials. Um, but there are some, there are some earlier phase burials um, for the most part. Uh, in the earlier phases and sort of the Republic, the archaic periods, uh, Romans were largely cremating their dead. Um, and we can't get as much information from <laughs> cremains, unfortunately, uh, because they're burned. Um, and the uh, third site um, that I'm uh, actually still currently working at um, is called Gabii. Um, and this is a project that started in 2007 um, uh, at the University of Michigan. And Gabii is a site, it was a city um, located just outside of Rome and uh, might have even predated Rome. Um, it's said that Romulus and Remus, the you know, founders of Rome, um, were purportedly educated um, at Gabii because it was this huge religious center. Um, so we see urban development at Gabii starting in the 10th to 8th centuries BC. Um, and uh, then it became much more important by the 6th century BC. And by the time Rome became Rome <laughs> in the sort of late Republic, early Imperial period, Gabi had started, had started to decline. Um, people weren't as interested in living in this area in the, the suburbs. It became um, agricultural fields. Uh, there was like aqueduct infrastructure and other stuff that was going in there. Um, so people weren't really, weren't really living there. Um, but it, uh, the Gabi is still being excavated. <laughs> um, it's this fantastically long lived project. They found um, amazing stuff um, from a millennium, more than a millennium of occupation. Um, and it's just, it's just really new and, and, and fantastic stuff. So Gabii, they didn't originally expect to find burial, <laughs> burials because they tend to be outside of city walls. Um, and so immediately when they started excavating, they started finding these imperial burials that were made when Gabii was collapsing, when it was essentially no longer a city um, and people started burying their dead there. But then progressively they started finding archaic burials um, and uh, burials from the late Iron Age of children as well. Um, so there are, there are at least three phases of burial here. But, um, oh, and there's a picture, there's another, it's a really nice picture of Gabii. Um, some of the, you can see some of the very large walls um, and the amazing architecture um, that they discovered that they didn't even know was there until they started, until they started digging. Um, it was sort of in a field. So here's, um, uh, this uh, image shows you uh, the imperial um, 
the imperial burials. And um, most of these are those cappuccino burials where you have the roof tiles set up over them in a, a sort of middle to lower class um, manner. Um, some of them have a few grave goods, uh, but there are some really interesting people um, on this slide. And so the person on the, these, all three of these burials um, were made in lead. Um, and they've been called the lead family. <laughs> this guy on the lower left um, was originally found in 2008, I think, um, as a subsurface anomaly. Um, they were out trying to figure out where all of the walls were and this thing like hit big. And when they started excavating it, they did not expect to find um, a burial, um, much less a person in this really weird lead coffin. Um, so this is a, a lead box that has been like squished somehow on top of the person. Um, and so his head is at like the pointy end. Um, and then the foot part um, has kind of opened up. And so that his, I guess, so his feet weren't exposed. They put um, that, that tile that you see there, that ceramic tile is just on top of his feet. Um, so it's been called the lead burrito, just because it kind of looks like a burrito. Um, and nobody's ever seen anything like it before. It's really weird burial. Um, but then they started finding these other burials. And so um, the one on the right is a woman who was buried um, on these lead sheets, which nobody had ever seen before. And then the one in the middle is um, a child of about three years old um, who uh, is is in sort of a ceramic sarcophagus, but then it had a very thin lead um, sheet on top of it, almost like aluminum foil, but like thicker. Um, and again, there's no comparanda. <laughs> like there's there there's just no direct comparison between uh, these burials and anything else that anybody's ever seen. So. Um, so the skeletons, of course, really piqued my interest. Um, and once they started finding skeletons, um, they called me in uh, to this project, um, which has been which has been so much fun. So, um, so the, those those three cemeteries uh, in Rome that I've looked at are Castel Bertone, Castellaccio, and Gabii. Um, so that's a little over two hundred people, which isn't a whole lot. It's not a huge sample, um, but it's a pretty decent sample size uh, in bioarchaeology. Um, and I just wanted to put Valerano on that map, um, even though I didn't study it, but it has been well published in terms of methods and results. So to look at life and death um, in the Roman Empire, we generally start with the cemeteries uh, and then we start with basic demographics. So to look at demographics, we examine um, specific parts of the body uh, or we measure specific parts of the body. One way to estimate sex, uh, biological sex, is through the pelvis. Um, the male and female pelvis, uh, of course, differ in their morphology or their shape because of childbearing. And um, that's not the only way. We also use skulls and a bunch of other things. But um, one way to estimate age at death um, is through uh, the degradation of joints. Um, so after we get to about age 40, <laughs> all of our bodies start to go downhill. Just biologically, our joints start to degrade. Um, and so on the lower right, you see what's called the pubic symphysis. Um, this is the joint at the front of your pelvis. Um, and the pubic symphysis on the left has these nice ridges um, because it's a younger individual. And the, per and the one on the right um, is very flat uh, because the pubic symphysis has rub together a little bit over time as you walk and jump and do other sorts of activities. Um, so we can figure out age of death by degradation of joints, um, sometimes by things like dental wear and other things like that. Um, for kids, it's much easier to look at dental development and eruption, and we can figure out their age of death to within about a year or two. Uh, with adults, it's somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 years. <laughs> we can't be terribly specific um, about adult age, unfortunately. Um, and then we're also interested in stature, how tall somebody was, because it tends to be a measure of, sort of vague measure of health um, and environment. Um, and so a way to measure stature is on the, the lower left, where you see a femur 
um, that we're measuring the maximum length, and then it's put into a regression equation and we get an approximate adult height. So what this means, um, if we turn to the Roman bones, then we can look at comparative demography. Um, we can look at age of death, for example, um, from these four sites that I've mentioned, which is what you see here. You see um, a significant amount of infant or childhood mortality. Um, adults aren't living very long. But obviously within these cemetery populations, um, there is a variation. And so some of that is likely due to preservation, um, which skeletons preserved. Some of it is due to small sample sizes. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's really interesting to, <laughs> to, to, to look at these different populations and, and try to figure out why, for example, there are no people in pretty much the, the 20 to, or the two to 20 year old range at Gabi. You know, they're most likely being buried elsewhere. Um, and we just don't know where they were being buried yet. So um, <clears throat> if we uh, were to look at biological sex, then uh, we would see an underrepresentation of females at most of these sites. Um, and that's, uh, it could be cultural if women are being buried elsewhere. Um, it can also be biological in that women tend to have smaller and lighter skeletons, so they tend to degrade um, more easily um, or more quickly. Um, but we can also look at stature, which is what you're uh, seeing here. Um, and stature is, uh, it's not just genetic. Um, obviously, your height potential is um, to some extent genetic, but it's also an environmental indicator. Um, if you are malnourished, if you're sick throughout your adolescence, you are not likely to reach your height potential. So what we see here is that um, uh, we do have some differences um, in the imperial period of Castellaccio, for example. There's about a 17 centimeter difference between males and females, which is about six and a half inches. Um, and that's a little bit, that's a little bit bigger, um, a difference than what we have uh, for today's Americans who are about 14 centimeters apart, um, male and female. Um, so again, it could be we're, we're looking at small sample sizes. It could be that females in certain environments like the Roman suburbs aren't uh, faring very well in terms of, of health and nutrition. So these types of low-level osteological data give us an understanding of change through time, like height, um, and an idea of geographic differences. So we can say those people who lived in the suburbs were a bit taller than those nearer to the city, um, and uh, then try to further investigate that. Um, demography is also important, though, because it helps us find women and children who are generally absent from uh, the historical record. But unfortunately, demography is really just a baseline. Um, to this, we have to add archeological information, historical information, um, and then orient our research questions. And then we need to layer on additional methods like paleopathology, like chemical analyses. So paleopathology is the study of diseases that manifest on bone. Um, as with demographics, we can get information about a person's health status through observing their bones, through observing their teeth, and noting anything that indicates a move away from the body's normal state, right? That moves away from homeostasis. So these are some skeletal examples. Um, we've got, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but we've got um, in the upper left, we've got crib, something called cribber orbitalia um, in the eye orbits. Um, and uh, that's an indication of anemia, those little tiny dots in the eye orbits, um, an indication of anemia. On the right, this is a zoomed in picture of a woman's face, her, um, her nose area, um, and you might be able to see how the, uh, um, the aperture there, the, the hole, the nose hole, um, is a little bit deformed, and this is because uh, her nose was broken, the bony part of her nose was broken, and then it healed. Um, probably indicating somebody, a right-handed assailant maybe, struck her in the face. Um, and then here on the lower left, um, ooh, it's actually a video. Oh, the video is working. Okay, at least on my screen. Um, this is um, a fifth metacarpal. Um, so this is below the pinky in your palm on the side of your hand. Um, and as you can see, it has lots of holes in it. It's not supposed to have those holes in it. Um, this is actually osteomyelitis um, or an infection of uh, um, 
of the inside of the bone um, and could have happened through a fracture or um, it could have happened through a paper cut. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I don't know what happened to this person, um, but they had this like raging infection um, in the bone of, uh, of one of their hands, um, which is unfortunate. And um, paleopathology, we also look at teeth. Teeth are great. <laughs> they tell us tons of information. Um, so in the, the upper left here, um, these are teeth. Uh, this, is, this is not um, dirt on the teeth. This is dental calculus, which is calcified plaque. That stuff that your dentist scrapes off your teeth. Um, that's what this is. And it's it's great for, for me anyway, because it preserves a lot of uh, little bits of like plant matter and food matter, um, but it's not great for teeth um, because it can lead to periodontal disease or gingivitis, which is what you see um, here on the right. Um, you see a recession of the bone um, following gingivitis, uh, and that can then lead to cavities. Um, and cavities uh, in the bottom part, um, you can see lead to abscesses, which is when the, the tooth root um, gets infected and then infects the, the, the bone. Um, so it creates this giant pocket of pus um, and infection, and then the tooth usually falls out. If you're lucky, the tooth falls out and then you heal and the infection goes away. Um, if not, an ancient Roman could have died from uh, one of these toothaches. So then that leads to anti-mortem tooth loss um, or um, teeth that, that fall out prior to death. So um, if you look at uh, uh, these collectively, these data collectively, um, you can see that different sites, again, have sort of different levels of, uh, of dental problems. So Gabii, for example, from the imperial period, has a high rate of curious lesions or cavities. It has a high rate of calculus, that calcified plaque. It has a high rate of abscesses, anti-mortem tooth loss. Um, but surprisingly, it doesn't have uh, really any Oh, it doesn't have any um, cribra orbitalia, which is an indication of anemia. So there was a lot of dental disease going on, some really bad teeth at Gabi, but overall um, they seem to be uh, uh, quite healthy. Um, and but then on the other hand, places like Valerano, there's a hundred percent of people, um, hundred percent of subadults um, or kids had um, had cribral orbitalia. So those researchers suggest that that area might have been uh, infected with malaria. Um, so these are, are questions that I you know or, or interpretations that need additional data um, and that need additional testing. So really it shows that these basic demographic data, basic pathological data, really just end up raising more questions. Um, so I have turned to chemical analysis to try to figure out more. And chemical analysis can tell us all of these things on this slide. Um, it can tell us about diet, migration, family relationships, um, and disease. So we'll start with diet. Um, since the Romans love to eat, the Romans love to throw dinner parties. Um, and to do paleo diet analysis, what you need are um, portions of ribs, um, just a little fragment of a rib from a skeleton, um, which gives you an idea of the average diet over the last five years of the person's life. And so this is the, this is the super science-y part, but I promise it's not really that bad. So for paleo diet, we measure the ratio of two isotopes of an element that's present in a sample. So in this case, the ratio is between 13 carbon, carbon 13, and carbon 12, um, which are called stable isotopes because they don't decay um, after the death of an organism. This is uh, different than carbon 14 or radiocarbon dating, which is radiogenic and decays and then helps us date individuals. So we're talking about stable isotopes here. So the ratio of carbon isotopes um, gives us information on the uh, carbohydrate portion of the diet. So we're mostly talking about grains here. And so, eh, I gotta move my little Greek chat thingy, hold on. Um, so what we're looking at um, with carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis um, is a distinction between different types of grasses or grains. So C3 grasses um, like wheat and barley um, have this lower carbon value Hold on, 
oh, there we go, C4 grasses, which are things like millet um, in the old world, sorghum, um, and maize or corn in the new world have a higher um, carbon value. And um, so nitrogen then, so carbon tells us about, mostly about carbohydrates. Nitrogen tells us about protein, the kinds of protein a person was consuming. So we're generally talking about where on the food chain the person was located. Were they vegetarian? Were they eating terrestrial meat or seafood? Um, so at the very bottom of the nitrogen food chain, we have nitrogen fixing plants like legumes here. Um, we've got grasses, which are a little bit higher. Um, these uh, cute little terrestrial animals, these little herbivores like this bunny. Um, then we have carnivores that eat the herbivores and their nitrogen goes up. Um, and then uh, uh, because the marine resource chain is longer, uh, people who eat seafood tend to have even higher nitrogen isotopes. Interestingly, babies also have very high nitrogen isotopes. Um, and that's because when they're nursing, they're consuming their mother's dissolved tissues. So they are essentially cannibals <laughs> and they have this higher nitrogen isotope value um, indicative of that. So that's coming up in a second. Um, so this is what those data look like um, after you do paleo dietary isotope data. I'm just, oh, there we go. I'm <laughs> moving my little zoom things around. Um, so paleo dietary isotope data um, are put in a scatter plot like this um, with carbon or carbohydrates um, down there um, on the X, protein or nitrogen on the Y. So what do these data mean? They're just dots. I think they're cool, but not everybody thinks they're cool. Um, there we go. There's our little Roman. So there's our little Roman eating. And basically what it means is that most people are eating C3 plants. So here's our wheat and our barley. They're eating terrestrial meat, um, generally pork. The Romans loved pork. They had tons of recipes for pork. Um, but there's input as well from beans and legumes. Uh, some people are eating seafood or marine resources or incorporating that into their diet. Um, and then there are even some individuals who are consuming that C4 resource, um, which was almost certainly millet, uh, which was, um, it's just still grown a whole bunch um, in the Italian peninsula. So um, the Romans, or at least like Roman writers, Roman historians talk a lot about millet and say like, nobody ate millet. It was a grain for the poor. It was only for animals. Um, but what we are seeing uh, increasingly from human skeletal remains is that people were indeed eating millet. <laughs> and it was just those um, elite people uh, who were talking about how nobody ate millet. Um, so especially these individuals who are uh, high on the millet side and um, low on the nitrogen, they might have been eating millet and beans, um, which were consumed a lot in, uh, uh, by the lower classes in the countryside. Um, so we have some of these uh, really interesting individuals, uh, this, this male in his mid-30s, he's eating a lot of millet. Um, but there's also this two and a half year old child who is very different on um, both the carbon and the nitrogen axis, uh, suggesting that this child was either still nursing or had recently weaned at the time of death. So, um, oh, and then there's another weird person from Gabi who's maybe eating a C4 diet. <laughs> um, uh, that's a little bit strange. Um, so th these data are interesting because there's lots of variation, um, especially in the Roman world, these data don't look like um, the data that my colleagues from, you know, who are working in South America or ancient North America um, have where people are much more clustered together. Um, this suggests that Romans were eating a ton of different things. Um, so I wanted to look for patterns in, in the data to see if there's anything that can explain why people are eating what they're eating. Um, and so one of the, the, the things that could maybe help explain that is migration, um, uh, where people were coming from. So um, <clears throat> to, to, to try to figure out migration, one of the things that, that you can look at, um, or you can use strontium and oxygen isotopes. Um, and so the same idea holds for these isotopes as for carbon and nitrogen. Um, basically, we're measuring the ratio between the two isotopes of these elements in teeth. Um, rather than bone, because bone remodels, but teeth don't remodel. There are these little time capsules um, in your body. So here, um, 
Strontium is incorporated into your body through groundwater um, that is like running over geology and basically picking up the signature of, of the strontium. Um, and then oxygen in your body comes uh, from uh, groundwater, but also inhaled oxygen. So um, oxygen ratios are affected by things like humidity and altitude. And then by looking at strontium and oxygen isotopes, um, you can kind of try to pinpoint where somebody came from. Um, it's not exactly a GPS, <laughs> like a biological tooth GPS. Um, but fortunately, because Italy has very interesting geology, um, it's a little bit, it's, it, it's, it's helpful. So um, here in the, the map of the Italian peninsula, you're seeing a little purple dot for Rome. Um, and you're seeing oxygen values uh, are much more negative in the Apennines, um, that spine of, uh, of mountains that goes down the peninsula, um, and more positive towards the coast. Strontium is uh, lower down in uh, newer geology, so volcanic areas like you see in Sicily um, or you know, Vesuvius, <laughs> the Bay of Naples area. Um, and strontium is higher in older geology, so like the Alps um, is going to have a, um, a higher strontium signature. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, shows you uh, all of those data, all of the data <laughs> that, um, that, that I looked at. Um, so these are individuals that I tested for both strontium and oxygen. Um, I think it was about 55 individuals for um, my dissertation just to see if it would work because nobody had ever done this before um, in Italy. Um, so what you're seeing are two individuals who are outside of the sort of signature of Rome. Okay, so that box is everybody inside the box could be from Rome. I can't exactly tell, but, but their isotopes look like they're Roman um, or that they're from the area of Rome. But these people outside of it are probably from somewhere else. So we've got a couple people who look like they're from the Apennines, um, somebody who might have been from a place like Liguria, um, which is coastal, but also in that older geology, um, a couple people from maybe Tuscany, um, Campania, which is south um, around Pompeii, um, Calabria or Sicily, um, and then a bunch of people who don't really look like they could be from the Italian peninsula. They might have been from some place like Greece or Cyprus or Asia Minor, um, because we know there was a lot of migration um, that happened from those areas. Um, and maybe even some individuals from North Africa um, or from Egypt um, and Nubia. So um, these, uh, these results definitely um, need uh, I don't know, more data, <laughs> like we, we need more study um, of these. But um, one of the things that, that, that I did with this um, is to say, if these are indeed immigrants, um, which I, I think they were, um, can we circle back to the idea of diversity in the diet? Can we look at the diet and say, did immigrants eat different stuff? Um, so the answer is yes and no. Um, I've got another scatter plot because I love, I love scatter plots. Um, and so this is actually showing you just carbon isotopes, but it's showing you carbon isotopes from bone and from teeth. And you'll remember that the bone gives us information about like the last five years of your life, um, while the teeth give, give you information about um, uh, your age when those were forming. Um, so this is actually a difference between um, about, uh, I don't know, one to four years old um, for the enamel of the teeth, um, and then pre-mortem diet five years before death. Um, and what you're seeing then is that several people have changed their diet from when they were kids um, to when they were, uh, right before they died anyway, they weren't necessarily adults. So these four people that I've highlighted um, statistically significantly changed their diets. Um, and uh, awesomely, they are all immigrants based on the strontium and the oxygen data. So um, this isn't uh, uh, earth shattering, right? You would expect that people who migrated from another area, especially from far away, are probably changing their diet. But the fact that we can now prove this on an individual basis is really cool. At least I think it's really cool. Um, so we, we still don't know why they were changing their diet. Were they doing it so that they could look more Roman or were they doing it because that's, that's all the food they had. <laughs> so they had to. 
So um, speaking of these individuals again, individual migrants, um, we can of course uh, use something like ancient DNA to give us even more specific information about people um, and their relationships. So I've started a, a DNA project, um, the Roman DNA project, to start answering questions about um, uh, individuals from that site of Gabii and the site of Aplantis, which is down near Pompeii. Um, so it's very slow going right now. I don't have any like earth shattering um, ancient DNA news um, because uh, it just, it takes a long time, I guess, or my DNA people are slow. Um, and so far we just have some sort of basic haplogroup data um, suggesting circum Mediterranean origins. Not terribly helpful, um, but we do hope to get biological sex um, from the amylogenin test um, and some new techniques to maybe get um, and DNA results as well, um, because we're particularly interested in knowing um, family dynamics, family relationships. Um, were these three individuals buried in lead a family? Um, and what does, what does that mean? Um, the Roman family was uh, generally biological, um, but it was uh, an extended family. Um, and then you would also add to that slaves and um, like cousins and friends. You can adopt pretty much anybody. So um, Roman families were very large and not necessarily just based on, on biology. So I have my fingers crossed that we're gonna get some good um, answers on uh, ancient Roman DNA at some point. But um, chemical analysis can also tell us about health and disease. Um, so the assumption from uh, historical records is that Rome was filthy, <laughs> it was disease ridden, um, life was you know, nasty, brutish and short. Um, but the Romans did also have flush toilets. They also had clean running water from aqueducts. Um, they had advanced medical knowledge. They had surgery, they had dentistry. Um, probably not available to all segments of the population. Um, but uh, so we've seen some of the pathologies that we can identify macroscopically, right? It's just by looking at them, uh, dental diseases, you know, fractures, other sorts of things. Um, but one of the problems with that method is that we can only identify diseases that cause changes to the bones. Not all of them do. Um, many diseases will kill a person <laughs> before their skeleton shows the effects of the disease. So if you think about it, often the people with skeletal evidence of say tuberculosis, those are the people who were healthy enough to live with that disease for a while before it killed them um, and so it could change their bones. So when working with cemetery populations, this is where uh, chemical analysis is useful. And so one of the important hypotheses to test is that Roman people were awash in lead poisoning, um, which may have led to the fall of Rome, right? I'm sure you've uh, heard about Roman lead poisoning. Um, and this is because the Romans are pretty infamous for their use of lead. Um, they had lead cooking equipment. They had water pipes, jewelry, lead shot, that sarcophagus that I showed you, um, cursed tablets. Um, but they also made a kind of sweetener um, from uh, lead sugar. Uh, called sapa or defrutum, where they just boiled grapes down in like a lead or pewter pot um, until uh, you had this nice, sweet, uh, lead-flavored um, syrup. Um, and so the Romans were not just using lead, um, but they were actually eating it, um, and quite a lot of it. So classical scholars have long assumed that um, the population suffered from rampant lead poisoning. Um, and so lead poisoning is, of course, bad, right? Um, the main problem is that it interferes with normal enzyme reactions um, in the human body. And lead can mimic uh, other metals that are essential to biological functioning, but since it doesn't work the same way as those metals, the enzymatic reactions that depend on things like calcium or iron or zinc can then be disrupted. So the most damaging uh, enzyme reaction that lead affects is the production of hemoglobin um, or red blood cell production, and this can lead to anemia. So in modern times, doctors often see anemia um, as one of the first things um, in, uh, that people with lead poisoning present. Um, lead is also really problematic because it stays in the body for a very, very long time once it's absorbed or inhaled or ingested. And most of that gets deposited in the bones and in the teeth. So lead can be removed from the body. Um, it can be excreted through the kidneys and urine, but it's a very um, slow process um, without modern 
um, therapy methods. So in modern society, lead poisoning is diagnosed through a blood test usually to determine the level of lead in, um, in the body, but we don't have blood in ancient remains. So we have to investigate lead through archeological context and skeletal markers of disease like anemia and chemical analysis of, of skeletons as well. So um, <clears throat> this chart um, actually shows you data from a study um, by my colleague, Janet Montgomery, who's at Durham University. Um, and it's focused, as you can see, on Roman Britain. Um, but she generously included several of my skeletons uh, from Rome um, in her study. And so it's organized by time period uh, from pre-Roman Britain um, through post-medieval Britain. And then within each time period, the data are arranged from lowest to highest lead levels. So there's obviously a range here of lead levels, um, but clearly in pre-Roman times, in Britain at least, um, they have reasonable levels of environmental lead um, with the Romans. And uh, the later medieval period, the lead is almost certainly related to this anthropogenic increase in environmental lead. So the World Health Organization has modern guidelines for uh, what measurements of lead in the blood constitute a safe level. Um, it's five micrograms per deciliter, um, which is essentially the same as um, half a milligram per kilogram reading in bone. Um, their level of concern is one and their level of severe lead poisoning is 10, which I have marked on this graph. So most people from Rome and even from Imperial era Britain are between that range, um, with some even well below the World Health Organization's level of concern. And so it means that it's really difficult to say whether or not the, the Romans were lead poisoned. Some of them most likely were. That really tall <laughs> green bar um, is you know, somebody who, as a child, because this is from teeth, um, as a child had a very high lead exposure. Um, but a lot more needs to be done in uh, human environmental interaction in Rome to answer this question of, of lead poisoning. Um, fortunately, several researchers are starting to study water and soil from Rome and its port city to look into this question further. Um, and some additional samples from my Gabii skeletons are currently being analyzed by a colleague at Mount Sinai in New York for lead levels. Um, so I'm hoping to have some more data um, within the next few months on those. And then increasingly, it's possible to use pathogen DNA to figure out um, pathogen DNA analysis to figure out what diseases people had at the time of their death. Um, and this is by identifying the DNA of the pathogens themselves in their bodies, um, rather than trying to look at their effects on the bone. Um, so this sort of work is still really quite new. Um, it's being done by people like Hendrik Poinar, who's at McMaster University, um, and it has been applied to some sites um, in, in Italy. Uh, there's a recent dissertation by Stephanie Marciniak um, where she looked at 58 adults and 10 kids from three different Italian sites, um, ancient Italian sites, um, analyzing dental pulp and looking for malaria, looking for the malarial parasite. In spite of having tested all of these people, um, they found solid evidence of malaria in only two people. Um, and uh, that was unfortunate, but um, malaria is notoriously difficult to isolate, I have been told. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that these were the only two people um, in the sample to have it. So um, I have partnered um, now with uh, Professor Poinar to do some of this work um, at Gabii and at Aplantis, but I don't have results yet. Um, and another avenue that I'm investigating is paleoparasitology. Um, so I'm partnering with Piers Mitchell, who's at Cambridge, and he's a world expert on ancient parasites. Uh, he started looking around the Roman Empire for um, evidence of parasites. And um, he and his team have uh, done a bunch of, of research. Um, in one case study, he looked at a Roman era site in Turkey, um, and they found uh, evidence of roundworm in all five of the human samples, um, which is one, actually one of the pictures here. Um, it's a roundworm egg. Um, so it means the human food supply at the site was contaminated because this is a fecal oral parasite. One human tested positive for Giardia, um, a protozoal parasite that causes dysentery. 
Um, and from one of my sites at Aplantis, uh, he uh, did indeed find a couple of uh, cases of roundworm and whipworm um, as well. So those, uh, the Romans were fairly infested with parasites, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, to, so to put, um, uh, I've been mentioning Aplantis, um, but I haven't uh, sort of properly introduced it. Um, you can see Aplantis on this map uh, near Pompeii. Pompeii, of course, is famous for being a city trapped in time, thanks to the volcanic eruption in 79 AD that wiped out a number of cities and towns and villas in the Bay of Naples. Um, so you've probably heard of Pompeii, Herculaneum as well. Aplantis is kind of um, in the middle of that. Uh, and it's not really a city though, uh, it's two main structures. Um, there's this huge villa, you can see the little people for scale there, um, which may have belonged to the wife of Emperor Nero, um, and it was actually unoccupied at the time of the eruption. It was undergoing repairs from a previous earthquake. Um, there's a second building um, on site, a sort of group of buildings that may have been an import-export business um, focused on wine. And so it's called a Plantis B. Um, it is not actually open to the public like Villa A is, so most people don't know about it. Um, but at the bottom of this plan um, that you're seeing um, uh, are storerooms that front uh, an, an ancient road. It's not a modern road, but um, there was an ancient road and the Bay of Naples, um, which um, is now a little bit further um, out on the coast. And um, it's got like amazing preservation. This is a two-story colonnade um, in the middle of this building. Um, and uh, the purpose of these structures is assumed through the nature of the artifacts. Um, so here we've got amphorae, which have been cleaned and dried and stacked upside down um, until they needed to be used. Uh, these are pomegranates um, that have been preserved <laughs> by the eruption of, of Mount Vesuvius. Um, and so these were ready to be, I don't know, probably added to the wine. This is a bronze seal um, that bears the name of Lucius Crassus Tertius, who was presumably the owner or operator of this wine business. Um, we don't have any other like, historical records of him. Um, so the business was very much in operation at the time of the eruption, and everybody appeared to have huddled in one room when they realized uh, what was coming. And so at the very bottom right, um, you can see the, the gates in front of that opening. Um, that's where uh, all of the people were. Um, and then next to it, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, next to it, uh, uh, you see an open area. And this was a staircase um, that went up to the, the second story of this complex, which probably um, people lived in and, and worked in. So skeletons were found here um, between 1984 and 1991, um, uh, all, oops, all in this room. And um, the first set were found, um, as you can see here, uh, sort of towards the doorway, which is on the right, um, and towards the, the, the back of the room. Um, and they were excavated uh, at the time and stored in these boxes. <laughs> um, on site, not very well. Um, and uh, then um, there was sort of a crisis in funding in Italy and Italian archeology span and the rest of the skeletons weren't excavated until the 1990s. Um, and so these are the skeletons um, as they looked uh, when I showed up in 2017. Um, they had been mostly excavated, but sort of left on their pedestals of dirt and they're sort of falling all over the place. And it's just really unfortunate um, preservation there. Um, so we didn't have very much time in uh, 2007, um, but one of our, our goals were to, to take out those skeletons, um, uh, do photogrammetry of the skeletons to uh, preserve a 3D model um, of what they looked like um, before we took them out, um, and uh, look for things like fractures, other pathologies, take soil samples, um, find any artifacts, there weren't a whole lot of them. Um, and then do some basic osteological analysis to figure out how many people were there, if they were male, female, kids, pathologies, relationships, why, uh, you know, any sort of uh, trauma that they had um, on their skeletons. So um, we accomplished photogrammetry on site in uh, 2017. This is uh, an example of photogrammetry um, and uh, 
there's a URL coming up on my, my last slide uh, where you can actually play with these uh, 3D models um, on a website. So um, I had a couple grad students come help me from back when I had grad students, which is really nice um, to have people come help you. Um, so there they are um, using a, an iPad-based 3D scanner um, to scan some of the, the skeletons while we're working in this tiny little room. We didn't actually have a lab on site. Um, it was just this one little room where uh, the, the site guards slept at night. <laughs> so there were like beds and stuff. Um, and uh, there's another example of scanning in the room um, with different materials. Um, and so these are, are uh, on a website um, that I've launched called Faces of Aplantis. And eventually I'm going to be working with a forensic artist uh, to play around with facial reconstructions um, and try to bring these individuals back to life, especially after we get DNA results back and know uh, for sure whether they're male or female and potentially what color hair and eyes they had, things like that. So we excavated these in situ remains um, since they were falling off their pedestals, weren't in great shape. Um, and they were really, they were more commingled than I thought they would be. There were sort of bones scattered all over the place. Um, and we didn't expect to find additional people. <laughs> we really thought that these were all the people. Um, but, oh, hey, there's my student. Um, but there were additional people. Um, once we started removing, especially the adults, there were some uh, infants underneath them. They were probably protecting them um, uh, you know, or holding them at the time of the eruption um, when they were killed. So, um, this is, uh, this is one of my uh, grad students. Um, she's actually still kind of a grad student of mine. I'm on her dissertation committee now, um, and she's at a different university. Um, and she was just super thrilled um, to be excavating at this site um, where we found things like coins. I think she's holding up a coin, um, pieces of oil lamps, um, and other sorts of things. There were organic remains um, that were there as well. So this sort of gives you an idea of um, the preservation. Um, so here, uh, uh, what you're seeing um, is a little, are, are little pieces of fabric. Um, they're sort of a stiff fabric. They, also, they honestly look like wood in this picture, but um, it's kind of a really stiff um, fabric. And I was very excited to find this. I thought this preservation was amazing. Um, I put it in a little specially labeled bag and tagged it in the photo model. I was really quite pleased with myself. Um, and so this was at the bottom of a skeleton after I had removed this woman's skeleton. Um, she was lying face up, she was on her back, and so I thought this was the back of her dress. Um, and uh, as archaeologists do, I took my trowel and decided to scrape to make sure I hadn't missed anything. Um, and I had missed stuff. Suddenly a bunch of little tiny bones um, popped up. Um, so the fabric wasn't the back of her dress, but the front of her dress um, and the bones were of her baby. Um, so this baby was nearly full term, um, at least 36 weeks, um, already rotated into a head down position uh, for birth. Uh, so it was just really remarkably preserved. It was the, it's the most preserved, most well-preserved fetal skeleton um, I've ever seen. Um, and this wasn't the only pregnant woman, um, even at this site. Uh, there was another near-term fetus found as well in one of the earlier excavations. Um, so this was a really um, sort of emotional, powerful moment for me, I guess, because um, I'd never excavated anything like that. And um, as a mom myself, <laughs> I just sort of imagined like what it would have been like when I was you know, in my third trimester um, to be faced with this uh, volcanic eruption. So. The, oh, here's a, a, a picture of the, the skeleton um, of the fetus once we had cleaned it up mostly. Um, you can see that there's, there's not a lot of the, the skull um, wasn't really preserved. I don't think we had any teeth, um, but it is, it is really, really well preserved um, for, uh, for a baby. So um, the people of Aplantis were relatively healthy. Um, I know that um, when they died, and that's kind of to be expected because these people were cut down in the prime of their life. Um, they weren't you know, sick and buried in the cemetery. Um, so we see typical dental issues like here, this is a mandible where somebody has lost a bunch of teeth um, prior to death. Um, this is a maxilla or the top part of the jaw um, where you can see some additional tooth loss, um, some uh, really fairly serious dental wear as well. Um, oh, this is a, um, a kid, uh, an adolescent around age 12, 
Um, and it's a little hard to, to see, um, but it has something called linear enamel hypoplasias or just enamel hypoplasias uh, when the enamel stops developing, usually because of a disease, because of um, some insult to uh, like metabolic processes. Um, so a really bad disease episode can cause your teeth to stop forming. And when they start forming again, you get a line or a pit or something. Um, so that's, that's this um, young adolescent. And uh, unfortunately, there's a, a like a BBC uh, uh, documentary out there with Mary Beard presenting it um, that claims that this is evidence of syphilis, um, but it is not. <laughs> it, is, it, it is really just a, a, a general metabolic insult. Um, there were only a couple examples of fractures. We've got this healed fracture of a humerus, um, very nicely healed um, humerus, um, and this skull on the right. I don't know if you can see where my pointer is, but there's just this little tiny indentation at the very top of the head um, that is a fracture um, uh, that it has healed. So I don't know what happened to her head. I, she was doinked on the head by something, something fell on it, somebody hit her, I don't know, but there's little evidence of a healed fracture right there. Um, but by and large, they were, they were really healthy. Um, and again, that's, that, that's sort of what we would expect. Um, so this means that my, my future plans um, for this cemetery um, include isotope analysis um, and also ancient DNA analysis, both of which are ongoing right now. Um, I got funding for those um, right before I quit my academic job and then was able to keep those um, grants, which is fantastic. Um, so those are both underway. I should get um, isotope data um, back any day now, um, which I'm excited about. Uh, we're going to be doing some reconstruction of the faces and maybe of the bodies too. Um, and this is because we really, we want to know who these people were. Um, is it really Lucius Crassus Tertius and his family? Um, are there workers? Um, are there slaves? Uh, multiple extended families? Are people biologically related? Um, there are suggestions that yes there are definite biological relationships um, here because i can look at um, heritable traits on the skull um, that do suggest that uh, there's there's sort of a basic genetic relationship among many of these people um, we don't though know how they died we obviously know that they died from mount vesuvius erupting but we don't know if they died all at the same time we don't know if they were suffocated by gas. We don't know if the walls just like caved in and the upper floor fell on them. Um, there are actually a lot of ways that they could have potentially died. Um, another suggestion at, at Herculaneum is that people were flash fried. That it was so hot that their skin just like burned off and their heart stopped immediately. Um, so we're trying to work on that, but there are obviously these, these issues of the skeletons being commingled um, that we might not be able to get around. So we want to know who the people were, how they were related, um, what kind of diseases they had, um, which is the question that I'm most interested in because um, we, have, we have lots of skeletons from cemeteries and they're dead for a reason <laughs> because they were sick. It's gonna be really, really fascinating to find out what diseases people were living with rather than dying from. Um, as far as I know, this hasn't been done um, in Italy other than that, that malaria study. Um, so that's gonna be super cool. Um, and we don't know how the site was related to that other villa um, that I showed you as well. So to sort of summarize um, what I found out um, about life and death in, in the imperial world, um, is, is that there was this really complicated interplay between cultural, environmental, biological factors that are affecting uh, Roman health and disease. And this result really counters the, the idea put forward largely by ancient demographers and historians that Rome had this high disease load across the board. Um, we definitely need more work in this area um, and uh, you know, even basic things like long bone length um, can help us investigate these secular changes in stature and health. Um, in particular, though, the Vesuvian area, area Pompeii, Herculaneum, Aplantis, really should be leading the way um, in characterizing health and disease. Um, because they're catastrophic mortality sites, we can learn a great deal um, about Imperial Italy. 
Um, but this uh, image on the right is one of the drawbacks, um, and that is that Pompeii was largely excavated a very long time ago, and the skeletons were not kept as individual skeletons. So here you see um, a bunch of femora. It's just a bunch of thigh bones, um, just all collected um, in one area. Um, so that's great, I guess, if you want to measure some thigh bones, but if you, you don't know if they're related to like a male or a female, you can't figure out age of death. It's not going to tell you anything, um, unfortunately. So there are skulls um, that can be investigated, um, but Pompeii is, is, is quite unfortunate that people from the, uh, like the 18th and the 19th centuries didn't think about what we would be able to learn um, eventually. So Roman bioarchaeology is, is really just beginning, but we need a lot more people and a lot more money um, to do it right. And this is one of the reasons that I do the outreach that I do. Um, as I've mentioned, skeletons really started being saved only in like the, the 1990s and prior to that, um, they, they generally weren't saved. They were sort of tossed out. Um, and then even when they were saved, the archaeological records aren't necessarily good. Um, so for me, outreach is a way to talk directly to the public, um, the public who funds my research, either through crowdfunding, which I did many years ago, um, or indirectly through something like the National Science Foundation, um, or through the public university, which I occasionally teach at. Um, and I like to talk about skeletons. Unfortunately, the public loves skeletons. Um, they love learning about how, how people lived in the past. Um, so I think pushing this field, my field of Roman bioarchaeology further is going to take, um, is going to require a lot of support uh, from the public. Um, so while I do push my own research field um, into these, uh, uh, into the stories that I write for uh, uh, Forbes and, and other sorts of outlets, um, I do make an effort to diversify my coverage as well. And one of my goals is to diversify the geographic scope of bioarchaeology news so that you're not just hearing about the ancient Romans, so that you're not just hearing about the ancient Greeks. They get a lot of media coverage. They're found all the time. There are no major restrictions to reporting on those skeletons or showing those skeletons. Um, but I do try to find uh, papers uh, to highlight from areas of the world that are underrepresented in the news. Um, so this is a, a map that I put together um, in, uh, in Google um, about all of, all of the locations of all of the pieces that I've written for Forbes and Mental Floss over the last three years, four years, I guess. I've written somewhere around 350 pieces on, uh, on ancient skeletons for, for these outlets. Um, and so I'm really trying consciously to, um, to diversify this, the, this coverage. Um, but I'm also trying to diversify the researchers whose work becomes news because most of us are not at a research university that has a good PR department. Um, and uh, I used to be at a university that didn't have a good PR department. And uh, when I came to them with a close paper um, that had an embargo date, they didn't even understand what an embargo was. So I try to be that person that, um, that colleagues can send their papers to, um, and then um, I will write it up and, and try to make it news and try to get them um, additional press coverage because Focusing only on work that's coming out of uh, large research universities really does a disservice um, to our collective understanding of the ancient world um, when good research is being done at all levels of the academic system and, of course, also outside of academia. So when I write for Forbes, when I write for Mental Floss, when I give quotes to CNN or the BBC, um, I draw on my years of teaching experience to figure out a way to translate these these uh, research concepts um, into information that like an introductory student would understand because that's, that's essentially whom I'm writing for um, when I uh, do this, this public outreach that I do. So if you're interested in learning more about ancient skeletons, um, the first link is um, my research URL and then my Forbes page um, where you can read about all sorts of things like a medieval warrior who has a uh, knife hand prosthesis. Um, prosthesis. Um, and uh, uh, you can also find me on uh, Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram for some reason. I think it's a thing the kids do. I'm not sure. Um, 
and so some of these I update and some of these I don't update. But um, yeah, so I appreciate you uh, logging on, zooming in for this and paying attention. And um, yeah, I love answering questions um, about skeletons. Clearly, I like talking about them. So um, if there's anything I haven't covered, if there's anything you've ever wanted to know um, about Roman skeletons, just let me know. Excellent. Yay.